This morning's reading is from John's account of the resurrection, uh, starting at the first verse in chapter 20 of his gospel through to verse 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outrun Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked into the tomb at the strips of linen lying there, but didn't go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still didn't understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, Tell me where you've put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in an Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Thank you, Peter, very much indeed. It's Friday. Jesus was nailed, dead on a cross. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday. Mary's crying her eyes out because her baby Jesus is dead. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are running in every direction like sheep without a shepherd. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday. Pilate's strutting around, washing his hands because he thinks he's got all the power and the victory. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday. People are saying, as things have been, so they will always be. You can't change anything in this world. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The temple veil ripped top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, the tombs opened. The centurion screamed in fear, truly, this man was the son of God. And Sunday's coming. It's Sunday. The angel, like dazzling lightning, rolled the stone away, exclaiming, he is not here. He is risen. It's Sunday. It's Sunday. It's Sunday. Marilyn Havocate's poem expresses that expectation. The Good Friday was not the end of the story. Something even more remarkable was about to happen three days later when Jesus rose again. 
The Easter story is told in all four Gospels. Yes, there are some differences in some of the details. But one thing is absolutely clear. The fact that the tomb was empty did not in itself prove that Jesus was alive. The first reactions amongst those that saw the stone had been rolled away were all of fear. The body of Jesus had gone. Something terrible had happened. And then, of course, that fear was gradually transformed into overwhelming joy and faith as Jesus himself met with one or another. And all of those early disciples were truly convinced that he was alive again. And it's because Jesus is alive that we're able to worship and celebrate together. I was looking back this week over some of the sermons that I had preached on Easter Sunday. I've noticed that I've spoken more often from John's account than from the other Gospels. Perhaps that betrays just a little bit of a a personal leaning towards that particular Gospel. But nevertheless, I come back to that account again today particularly because it seems to me that Mary Magdalene's experiences are so pertinent to our own lives at this time. And I also come back to this particular account in the light of reading a very interesting book by Jeannie Kendall, Held in Your Bottle, exploring the value of tears in the Bible and in our lives today. Jeannie is a Baptist minister and also teaching at Spurgeon's College. In John's account of Easter Day, Mary was the first to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away. So she went to find Peter and John. They went to the tomb, found that the linen cloths were lying there, but no sign of the body of Jesus. The disciples returned to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. A few moments later, She saw two angels who said, Woman, why are you crying? Why are you crying? And so this is our theme for this morning. Through the tears. You may have noticed this image on Facebook that uh, Nicola posted just a few days ago advertising this morning's service with our theme, Through the Tears. And this morning I would like us to just take a few moments to think about tears. Seems to me that there have been quite a lot of them in the last year or two. And tears can mean so many different things. There can be tears of regret, can't can't there? I wish I'd done something differently or I hadn't done something that I did. And it can't be changed now. Tears of loss. Someone close to you has died and the pain runs deep and the tears flow again and again. And especially for those who were grieving during lockdown where that process was restricted in so many ways and the loss is felt even deeper. Tears of distress. There have been many, many tears of distress. Amongst the Ukrainian refugees who've been through such a traumatic time, and find themselves having to start life all over again, beginning to process the huge trauma of sudden evacuations. Tears of distress for those who remain in the Ukraine. Tears of stress, distress now for so many in South Africa, as we've already just briefly in our prayers mentioned, the floods that are so devastating and so traumatic. Tears of anger. You feel let down by others in one way or another. You're faced with a personal injustice or you see injustice inflicted on other people and the emotions well up inside you and tears flow out. Tears of stress. Challenging times that you're facing. Maybe stressful times around exams. Maybe being a full-time carer in your own home, holding a family together 
in difficult circumstances, keeping confidences over the lives of other people. The stress rises, the tears flow. Tears of pain. Something has touched your heart deeply. Something you long for is not happening. Prayers that you've offered to God time and time again have not been un seemingly answered. And you cry in deep anguish before God. Not all tears are the result of difficulties, of course. There are other kinds of tears, too. There are tears of gratitude. Overwhelmed with a sense of thanksgiving at the kindness that someone has shown towards you. Tears of friendship. That deep bond with another person within family or within networks of friends, such that times of parting and times of reuniting will often be emotional times and the tears flow. Tears of empathy. Hearing the story of another person suffering and finding that a moment of emotion rises up within you as you listen to their story and a tear silently forms. Tears of joy. Sometimes you'll see a winning athlete shed a tear as they perhaps have a media interview or their success when they're standing on the winner's podium. So many different kinds of tears. And all those different kinds of tears are represented in the pages of Scripture and are echoed in our lives today. And if you want to explore that further, then I do recommend Jeannie's book to you, Held in Your Bottle. Mary's tears in the garden on Easter Sunday, what were they all about? Well, I would suggest that they, uh, there were tears of loss in Mary's heart. There were tears of stress in the challenge of that situation. There were tears of distress. And there were tears of regret. And maybe there were other kinds of tears also. And they were all gathered in that emotive moment as Mary sat outside the tomb weeping, weeping. Now, your tears today may be the same as Mary's, or they may be quite different. And for some of you, tears may come easily and you cry often. For others, like me, it's very rare to actually cry. But nevertheless, you can see in yourselves, as I can see in myself, some of those emotions rising, which might well give rise to tears. But of course, the most important part of this story was the way in which Jesus responded to those tears and came and spoke to Mary by name. Jesus reached through the tears and he spoke to Mary. And she responded in that amazing word, Rabboni, which means my own Lord and Master. An amazing just sort of gathering together of all that Jesus was in that one word of recognition. Her tears of sorrow were transformed into tears of joy as she threw herself at the feet of Jesus in wonder and in worship. So how does Jesus come to us today? How does the risen Lord meet with you, meet with me today at our point of need and take us to a new and different place right now? For those of you who are online, I'm going to bring up one or two PowerPoints, so you'll lose my face on the screen, but you'll still have my voice, I hope, as we continue for a few moments longer. And just think about these things, that first Jesus sees your tears. Psychologists, Psychologists will often underline the importance of being seen and heard as part of our human well-being. If we think that nobody sees us and nobody hears us, then it's easy to reach a place of desperation or even of despair. But initially, when Mary stood outside the tomb, there was nobody around. No one saw her tears. Until she bent inside the tomb and then the angel saw her tears. And then the person that she thought was the gardener saw her tears. 
and the truth was that Jesus saw her tears. We often read in the Bible of how God sees the tears of his people. Moses at the burning bush, the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people. I have heard their cry. I have seen their tears. God sees your tears. He knows the longing of your heart today. And then Jesus calls you by name. Names are important, aren't they? They express intimacy. They express connection. Jesus doesn't remain aloof. He doesn't remain distant, either in time or in place. He's right here, and he addresses you. He addresses me by name this morning. That was a moment of true revelation for Mary. That was the moment when she knew it was the Lord. And this is what Easter's all about. Jesus Christ coming to you, coming to me, speaking your name because he knows you, because he loves you, because he understands you, because he wants the best for you. It may seem a big jump from Easter 2,000 years ago to Easter Day 2022. But the reality is that Jesus came back to life never to die again. And that means he is as alive now as he was on that first Easter day because he's never died. He's never been any less in the world today than he was in that moment when he burst through the grave alive forevermore. He came to Mary. He came later to the disciples. He came to others in those early weeks after the resurrection. And Jesus is no less alive today. He comes to you, comes to me. He calls us by name. Listen. Hear that call. Know his voice. Follow him now. And Jesus empowers you to live for him. Mary wanted to cling on to Jesus. And Jesus actually told her to let go. He was soon to ascend to the Father. And the future of following Jesus for, for Mary was not to see him in person, was not to hold his hand in a physical sense, was not to cling to his feet in a physical sense, not to cling to his physical body, but to go and tell everyone that he is alive and that he alone can bring forgiveness, joy, peace and hope. And Mary went with excitement. Her tears of distress were transformed into tears of joy. I have seen the Lord. This is true faith. Based on the solid evidence of what happened on that first Easter today, brought to life by Jesus being the risen Christ who comes among us now. He calls each of us by name and then he empowers us to live for him every day. Some of you may have seen the post on Facebook from last Sunday at the Central Baptist Church in Lviv, in, the, in Ukraine. And what I quote is what was written by the author of the Post, who was there at the service last Sunday. And this is how it reads. The church is hopeful. The song God's love is bigger than the ocean is sung with conviction. Children gather for the Sunday school for the first time since the war started. To the question, what can we thank God for? The answer, we are alive. We are safe. We can gather in the church. God is blessing us. The worship leader invites people to pray in small groups, and the sound of prayer fills the church. We pray for the Ukrainian government and for the people who have to make decisions. We pray for the Church of Christ in Ukraine to be strong and bring glory to God. We pray for justice and peace. We pray for people from different parts of Ukraine. And there are those who gathered in the church who bring greetings. The vice president of the Ukrainian Baptist Union shares a message that there is nothing bigger in the world than the love of God. This church is full of people and full of hope. And the picture that you're seeing on the screens at home and here in the building is that church last Sunday morning. This is what the risen Christ is able to do, to bring life and hope, 
joy and peace when all around is darkness and despair. And to journey through the tears of sadness, not to take them away, not to remove the pain and the stress, but to take us through those tears to a better place, to tears of joy, to tears of gratitude, to tears of hope, to tears in the presence of Jesus. Finally, to remind you that there are no more tears in heaven. The resurrection of Jesus was not the point where tears came to an end. It was the guarantee that one day there will be no more pain, no more crying, no more darkness. In the words of Revelation 21 and verses 3 and 4, for I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, see the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the former things have passed away. Our celebration of Easter brings us the conviction that Jesus is alive today. But it also gives us a foretaste of that wonderful eternity. No more tears in heaven.